Hi, our names are Jeff and Leanne Peters, and today we're going to be talking to you about self-cruising through the inland waterways of Europe. That is, driving your own boat through the rivers and canals of Europe. So today, what we're going to talk about, after a short introduction, we'll start talking about how to choose your own boat, and then we'll talk about some of the licenses and permits that you need for cruising through Europe, the navigation, uh, and some of the major costs involved, visas of course, and then we'll give you some tips and tricks at the end in case you decide that you want to go cruising yourself. First, an introduction. I'm Leanne. And I'm Jeff. We're an ordinary Australian couple with little boating experience who early in 2017, when we were aged in about our mid-50s, decided to retire early and spend time each year cruising through the rivers and canals of Europe. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, most of the rivers in Europe are connected and then interconnected by a series of man-made canals, which is wonderful infrastructure. And this is the way that produce and goods was transported through the regions of Europe back in the days before engines were invented for trains and trucks. And even today, I mean, there's still a lot of commercial use or these large commercial vessels that transport produce throughout these waterways. The inland waterways are an amazing infrastructure achievement where you can cruise literally thousands of miles throughout Europe visiting incredible cities and towns and villages all along the way. Yeah, and if you need to go up in altitude or uphill, what you do is you drive into one of these locks. You drive in, secure your boat, the, the door, the gates there behind you close up, and then the water rises, and you adjust your, your ropes or your lines as the boat rises, and then when the water comes up to the same level as the, the river or the canal in front of you, the gates at the front open, and you just drive out. It's pretty easy to do. After you've done it a couple of times, it's, it's very easy. We'll do a full presentation about locks, including demonstrations during a later video. So if you want to see this, please subscribe to our channel. Yep. So how we got started. Way back in 2009, we had the opportunity to travel to the beautiful Burgundy region of France and we cruised around on this 10 metre fibreglass boat for a couple of weeks. And while we were there, we met a lot of Brits, uh, Aussies and Kiwis, who do this all the time. We, we had no idea that it even existed. But they cruise around for six months each year, and then they go home for the other six months. We loved the idea of doing this ourselves, and our retirement dream was born. Yep. And then in mid-2016, some events conspired to make us take a really good look at what we wanted from life. We did our sums, and we checked those sums with some financial advisors, and we decided that we could and that we really should do this now while we're still healthy enough to really enjoy the lifestyle. Uh, we purchased a 12-metre motor cruiser in England, we renamed it Sunshine Coast in honour of our former home of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And then in June 2017, we cruised it along the southern coast of England, past the White Cliffs of Dover here. As you can see, it was a beautiful day. And then we headed into the Thames, uh, up to London. We cruised under London Bridge and Tower Bridge and past the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben, just the two of us. So it was a really surreal experience for us both. And then uh, after spending a month on the boat in London, we took the boat out into the English Channel, crossed the Channel, and wound up in Dunkirk in France. And just as an aside, while we were there, we actually went and saw the movie Dunkirk. Um, and then we walked out to the uh, evacuation beaches and had some wine and some frits or fries while we were there. So our original plan was to cruise exclusively through France. The lovely Belgian couple that we met at Dunkirk Marina recommended that we first take a look at Belgium while we were so far north. So, the first season, we spent cruising around beautiful Belgium, which we can highly recommend. It was absolutely stunning, and if you're into history, or the first, especially First World War history, it's absolutely brilliant. So we rented our boat at a marina in Antwerp in Belgium that first year, and then someone told us that the Netherlands was a boating paradise. So the second season, we went Dutch and we started cruising through the Netherlands. And by the way, it is an absolute boating paradise. And then 
While we were there, another friend suggested that Germany was very good as well. So in our third season, we cruised through to Germany, uh, along the Rhine, and then across Germany to Berlin. We had a sensational time. So we want to talk to you about choosing a boat. Now, obviously, choosing a boat is a very personal matter. You have to know what type of cruising that you want to do yourself. You have to know what you need versus what you want on board your boat, and, of course, the big thing, your budget. We can tell you how and why we chose our boat, but we've met lots of boaters along our journey that have different types of boats who all swear they have the best boat ever, which is great because it means they've got the boat that best suits them. This includes Dutch steel boats and barges that come in all sizes from 14 to 40 metres long, and they're like a real house on the water. Yeah, they're great. The reason we chose the boat that we did is because our plans are to someday take the boat out into the Mediterranean and cruise around the beautiful coastlines of the countries lining the Med. But we also wanted to cruise around the rivers and canals of Europe first, especially so we could get the experience and the confidence ready to tackle that open water of the Med. So we needed a boat that was versatile enough to do both. Now, after lots of online research, I found broom boats. Broom are a boat building company in England that were around for 100 years and they had a very good reputation for quality. Their boats are built as coastal cruisers, so perfect for the med. But the radar arch, or the highest part of the boat, folds down, as do the windows, which reduces what's known as the air draft, or the distance between the water line of the boat and the highest point on the boat. And this makes it perfect for going under all the bridges in the inland areas of Europe. We can get our air draft down from five and a half metres to three metres by lowering the radar arch and the windows. Yeah. So ours is a 12 metre fibreglass boat, which barge owners call yogurt tubs. They're not very nice. And it has two engines and makes it very easy uh, to manoeuvre. And you can see here how the radar arch folds down. Um, it's easy for the two of us to handle, but it's also spacious enough for us to have guests. We can do a top speed of 26 knots, which came in very handy when we crossed the English Channel, and it means that we have enough power to get out of any trouble we might get into. We have an aft cabin layout with an island or walk around bed, it has an ensuite, and up front we've got another cabin with two single beds and another bathroom. The galley is small, but it has everything we need, although we are thinking of adding some extra refrigeration. Yeah. That would save going to the supermarkets quite so often. We have a generator, but we're also thinking of installing an inverter so we can use the coffee machine and other appliances without having to turn on the generator. We also added a washing machine to the boat during our second season, and it's been a great asset. Yeah. We'll try and put a link to a tour of the boat um, at the bottom of this page so you can take a look if you're interested. Barges are very popular, and many of our friends have these. You can get them any size, but most are between 17 and 30 metres. They've got lots of rooms with virtually full-size kitchens, bedrooms, bathrooms. And if you were going to live full-time on a boat, we would probably go down this route. Yeah. But from our perspective, the downside to barges is that they obviously can't operate in the Mediterranean, which, as I said, we want to do, or really any open seas. They're usually heavy boats with only one small engine, so there's certainly a lot more work involved with berthing and manoeuvring these boats. And we're not really into work, are we? Uh, no. No, we're not. Whatever you do, my recommendation would be that if you're considering cruising around the inland waterways, first do your research. Hire a boat for a few weeks, and while you're there, go and speak to other people. Ask them if you can have a look around their boats and get as much information as you can. People are usually very happy to help and proud to show off their boating homes. They love to talk about them. Yeah. Sit on the hire boat and ask yourself, if you were going to be doing this for an extended period of time, what else would you need or want? What best suits the type of cruising that you want to do? And, of course, the budget. The Netherlands is a perfect place to try out boating. There are lots of hire companies with good quality boats and the infrastructure is very good. The country is basically flat, so there aren't many locks to negotiate, just bridges to pass under. Yeah. 
Once you decide on the type of boat, you can break it down to the make, model, size, etc. You can check online for your purchasing options. Uh, what I did is I made a short list and then I came up with a favourite from that short list. I then travelled from Australia to England and to personally inspect the boat. I conducted a sea trial, tested it out, but the most important thing I did was arrange for a professional survey report on the condition of the boat. It will save you money. I also got a report on the most expensive part of the boat, which is the engine. So get a professional mechanic to give you a report. Uh, I then sat on the boat for a couple of hours to get to know it and you know, thought to myself, where would this go, where would that go? Uh, now, I'd never really driven a boat this size before and it was a bit intimidating at first, especially the berthing side of things. But after a while, it became very comfortable and after a few weeks, we were very confident in our ability and we were able to park her on a sixpence. Our boat is registered and insured in Australia. Because we both only just have Australian citizenship, we don't have any other citizenship, we didn't really qualify to keep it registered in England or any other European country. The only other option was having it registered in Jersey. But we wanted to fly the Australian flag. Flying the Australian flag's been an advantage to us though. Most people assume we're Brits, but once they find out we're Australian, especially in France, they seem more willing to help because we're a bit of a novelty. And we haven't invaded their country at any time recently. Yeah. So we're talking about licences and permits. And when all this started, all I had was a Queensland boat licence. And when we got to England, I was really surprised to find out that you don't need a boating licence to, to drive a boat around England. But in on the continent, on the European continent, you need what's known as an International Certificate of Competency, or an ICC. Now, I looked into getting one of these before we left Australia and couldn't find anywhere in Queensland to obtain one for a motor cruiser. You could get one for a yacht, but not a motor cruiser. When I looked at getting one in England, I was absolutely flabbergasted by how much it was going to cost. It was something like over £2,000. So it was really only halfway through our second season in Europe that I actually got myself an ICC. We were in the Netherlands and found someone by the name of Jan Gert, who did ICC testing as well as VHF radio testing. We actually travelled to him in the village of Maasbommel, where I did the testing. It took a couple of hours and it cost less than 200 euro to gain the ICC. I'll put a link below to Jan's email. I've actually never been asked to produce my ICC, but it's good to know that it's there if I need it. I've also completed a SEVNI course, which is C-E-V-N-I. It's basically a online course about the rules of the road of the inland waterways of Europe. And so you need to do that, and I'll put a link for that below too. Actually, the only time we've ever been asked for any sort of documentation was when we first cruised into Germany. We were stopped by this water police uh, patrol boat here uh, by these uh, two lovely gents and they didn't want to actually see the ICC or any other qualifications. They just wanted to see our boat registration. They wanted to know that we actually own the boat and once they were satisfied they put all our details into their computer system and after that whenever we saw a German water police boat they just waved us through. So in terms of boating permits, when we arrived in Dunkirk, we obtained a permit for the French waterways from VNF, the regulatory body in France, and we'll put a link to their website below. A permit or vinaigrette for us at 12 metres costs 53 euro for a month or 383 euro for a full year. And once you pay that permit, you don't pay for anything else. You don't pay for going through the locks or you know any of that other uh, other infrastructure costs. And when we cruised into the Flanders region of Belgium, we had to pay a small permit fee there too. But in the German area of Belgium, there's no fee. Uh, the Netherlands and Germany have no permit fees either. Although in the Friesland region of the Netherlands, which is a stunning area and it's absolutely fantastic cruising. You pay 15 euros for what's known as a Marakite flag, which entitles you to stay on hundreds of free moorings throughout that region. In some places in the Netherlands, there's often an official who opens the bridge for you. As you pass, he'll hold out a wooden clog at the end of a pole, 
you put a couple of euro into the clog as you pass through, and that's basically your toll fee for passing through the bridge infrastructure in the area. And it's recommended that you do put some euros in because you might be waiting a long time for the next bridge if you don't. <laughs> so now we'll talk about navigation and costs. So navigating through the rivers and canals is very easy. Basically, if you can drive a car, you'll be able to get by. Obviously, there's no tides to worry about. There's, the conditions are usually very calm on most rivers and canals. You haven't even got any current. Large rivers like the Rhine do have current, so you've got to really choose the route that you want to take so you're going with the current during those times. You cruise down the right-hand side of the river uh, at a maximum speed limit of 6 knots or about 11 kilometres per hour, and it's very relaxing. It is very relaxing. It's fantastic. We actually, just on that, we've got a lot of friends who travel with caravans and RVs, and they love that lifestyle, and, and it's great. Um, but they often say to us that what they do is similar to what we do, and I suppose it is to a degree. However, if I'm driving, especially if I'm pulling a caravan, all I'm really doing is watching the road ahead of me and worrying about the truck coming the other way at 100 kilometres an hour, uh, and so you don't see much apart from the road. And I'm always just watching the road, making sure he's seen that truck coming towards us. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, but on a boat, it's different. You're only travelling, as we said before, a maximum of six knots. You see and you notice everything along the way. You have time to really appreciate everything and are basically forced to relax. Now, there aren't really any current written cruising guides available these days because everything is online. But easily, the best navigation aid that we've come across has been ME Maps. Now, we downloaded ME Maps from the Google Play Store onto our tablet. Then we joined the Dutch Barge Association, or the DBA, and there is a link below to the DBA. The DBA have an overlay that you put over ME Maps. Now, over the years, members of the DBA have put information about hundreds of moorings and marinas, and this is all included on that overlay. This information gets updated by members as they travel through those regions. So, for example, if the cost of a marina has increased, for example, then the person travelling through will update that, uh, that cost. There's information about free moorings as well as where you need to pay, information about the town or city, supermarkets close by, train and other transport options, best restaurants, costs involved, even the water depth where you'll be mooring the boat. Yeah. We use it every day and it's been absolutely invaluable. We're often asked how hard it is to find somewhere to stay as we travel through the rivers and canals. The answer to that is it's very easy. There are lots of commercial marinas and many of the cities and towns along the canals provide mooring places to encourage visitors. Some of these are free, some of them you pay for, but compared to places like Australia and England, the cost of staying in a marina in England, inland Europe is very low. Yeah. Our experience has been that we pay from about one euro or between one euro and one euro fifty per metre per night in the marinas. This usually includes power, water and internet. So we're 12 metres, so we pay about 18 or up to 18 euros per night. We'll let you do the conversion to your own currency for that. But over the last couple of years, cruising through the Netherlands and Germany, we have on average spent just over 50% of our time on free moorings. Um, these are everywhere. Now, here's a photo of us right in the centre of major city of Berlin. And you can see us, that's us on the side there. In the background, you've got the Reichstag building, the German Parliament building. That's how central we are. And it was the same case in Amsterdam and other major cities as well. Most of these don't have any facilities like water and power, but we're able to spend about seven nights out before we need to head into a marina to fill up with water and get onto shore power. Yeah. Wintering the boat is another expense, a major expense. Now, we cruise between early May and early October when it starts to get too cold for us. We wintered the boat at a marina in Antwerp in Belgium for the first two seasons. It was out of the water on a hard stand in a secure area and cost around 1,250 euros for the six months. Then the, the third season, we found a marina in Germany who had just built a new warehouse. Um, so we kept the boat. It was more expensive, it was slightly more expensive, but uh, it was worth it because the boat is inside and out of the elements. 
make sure you know exactly where you want to winter and try and book well ahead. So on to visas. I have to say this section really applies to Australians, but there might be some information that helps other nationalities as well. Yeah. So most European countries are part of the Schengen zone, which means that there are really no internal borders within Europe. When you pass from one country to another in Europe, nobody, including people from outside of Europe, need to show passports or ID. Now, our problem is, as Australians, on tourist visas, technically, we're only allowed to be in the Schengen zone for 90 days or three months out of every six months. But we want to cruise the waterways for five or six months. How do we get around that? Well, as it turns out, there, that when the Schengen Agreement was signed, countries had the option of either maintaining or rescinding the bilateral agreements they already had in place at the time. And eight European countries, countries like Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Italy, Finland, Sweden and Norway, all signed agreements with Australia way back in the early 1950s, and these agreements are still in place. So Australians, and probably other nationalities, are able to spend additional time in Europe if they manage the system correctly. So the way it works is, say we fly into France and cruise around on the boat virtually anywhere in Europe for three months. Then we leave after our three months and go to a non-Schengen zone country like the UK or Cyprus, even if it's only for one day. Then you have to fly back into one of the countries we mentioned earlier, one of these countries um, that has the agreement with Australia. And then you're allowed another three months in that country. Now you're not supposed, technically, you're not supposed to leave that country, but with no internal borders, you can really travel anywhere within Europe. But you have to leave again from the same country. Yeah. So, for example, in 2019, we flew into Belgium and picked up the boat in the Netherlands, in Antwerp. Um, we cruised across Belgium into the Netherlands, down into France, uh, along the Moselle to Luxembourg, and then into Germany. And then we hit the Rhine. And then after our initial three months was about to expire, we flew out of Cologne in Germany to the UK. When... Then we flew back into Cologne and we spent almost another three months cruising around Germany before once again flying out of Germany. No one asked any questions at all. In fact, a few weeks later we flew into Portugal and no one asked any questions there either because our Schengen time had started again. Now we have friends who don't bother with any of this and haven't had any issues either. It might be that these European countries have bigger issues to deal with than some Aussies wanting to spend money in their country. But at least this way, it's all legal. Yeah. So for peace of mind, and because Leanne is very careful, some would say pedantic, we wrote to the embassies of each of these eight countries to confirm that the agreements were still in place. And then we take the written confirmation with us whenever we pass through customs, something that I would strongly recommend. So some tips for you. Now our biggest tip is to talk to other people. Most people on boats are very happy to pass along information and help others. If you see a boat coming into a berth, go and off to give them a hand. It's a great icebreaker and people often appreciate the help. We're often invited aboard other boats and we talk about must-see places, tips on boating and many other things. We've made so many friends cruising around, so don't be shy. Now, of course, you don't spend all of your time on the water. The whole idea is to travel to locations, cities, towns and villages to get involved with the culture in those places. In this case, culture is a wine festival, isn't it? Of course it is. <laughs> it's great to meet people and make new friends. We try to get to locations where we can be involved in events or festivals and it just adds to the amazing experience that we, that we enjoy. Um, now, there are a couple of Facebook pages that we would also highly recommend. The first is Wobs on Barges. Oh. The first is Women on Barges. That's abbreviated to Wobs. There are about 2,500 Wobs members, including me, on Facebook. Some cruising with their partners and some doing it all alone. This page has been both helpful and scary. 
scary because it is basically a support group for ladies and some of them have had some awful experiences. But overall, it's a great group for gaining information. They have their own Warbs Burgi or flag and whenever you see it on another boat, you automatically know that you're welcome. You can come and have a chat, a cup of coffee and a drink or two, of course. There's usually a drink or two. Now, the male version of Wobs is Bobs, or Blokes on Boats, and similar to the ladies, this is a great group to join on Facebook to get ideas for repairs, maintenance, etc. I would also, as I said before, highly recommend joining the Dutch Barge Association or the DBA. We're often asked about travel insurance. We use a company called World Nomads, which offers cover that suits our, our travels. But Australians also have reciprocal medical agreements with the UK, Belgium and also the Netherlands. Now, internet's a big issue and um, we don't have an address in the UK or in Europe and therefore we didn't qualify for a European or English bank account. So we couldn't get an internet plan. Initially, all we could do was get an expensive pay-by-the-month in, pay internet account. But while we were in France, we came across a company called Free. They have vending machines at locations throughout France, and you can see them on their website. And we were able to purchase a SIM card, giving us 40 gigabytes for about 20 euros per month. And that's the best deal we've been able to come by so far. We eventually got an international bank account through a company called TransferWise, and I'll put their web type, website details below too. But that basically gives you a UK or a European or an American bank account, whatever you you really want to do and it's a wonderful asset and it's much cheaper to use them to transfer money uh, internationally as well. Another tip especially when you're just starting out and don't have a lot of boating experience don't hesitate to call ahead to the marina you are visiting and ask someone to come out and give you a hand to berth they're more than happy to help. Yeah. Another one is the more you know about the boat and how it works the better you'll be. Get in and under all of the hatches, find out what leads to what, find out where things are located. Uh, I recently took the opportunity to do a marine diesel maintenance course so that I can now service and maintain our, our engines myself. Um, of course, YouTube is another great help asset as well. You will make mistakes. We certainly have and we still do. But don't worry, just learn from them. And remember, the mistakes are the ones that make the great stories over drinks. Yeah, not so much at the time. <laughs> now, we'll be making some more videos about our travels. Um, we basically travel full time. We cruise on our own boat, as we said, between May and October. And then we continue our travels. I conduct lectures aboard cruise ships. And then we will find any, fill any gaps by doing some pet sitting, which we absolutely love. We'll be doing some more videos about those options and post them on our YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe. If you have any questions about self-cruising, our Facebook page is Retired Afloat and our website is retiredafloat.com. So don't hesitate to give us a call or you know, contact us some way uh, and ask any questions. So that's it from us. hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll hope to see you on the waterways at some stage. Bye, Bye for now. now.